Is everybody in? Is everybody in? The ceremony is about to begin. This is very real. Fantastic. This drug is dangerous. Wrong. You cannot play with it. It's not funny. It's, it's not something to laugh about. Good people don't smoke marijuana. Shut your little punk ass up. But the more you hate me, the more you will learn. Learn. Welcome to episode 64 of the Autoflower Podcast, where we chat with growers, breeders, and anyone relevant to the Autoflower cannabis community. I'm Chad. I'm a fellow Autoflower cannabis home grower, and I want to take a moment to just say thank you. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. And thank you for supporting this podcast. It really means a lot to me, you guys, and I appreciate it. Big shout out to new Patreon members Rocco, Joseph, and Lucas, all of who signed up for the Flowering Club tier. Thank you guys so much for your support. And to all the Patreon members, uh, as of today, there are 127 of you, and I'm so very grateful for each and every one of you. If you would like to check it out, head over to patreon.com slash autoflowerpodcast to learn more. I'd like to thank the companies who partner with me to help support this podcast. Autopot USA, who offers amazing, affordable, simple, gravity-fed automatic watering systems. There's no electricity, there's no timers, it's just a simple system with a reservoir that automatically waters your plant when they need it. Use the coupon code AFPODCAST at checkout on their website, autopot-usa.com, to save 10% on all their products. AC Infinity, who sets the bar when it comes to indoor ventilation systems. They offer inline fans, carbon filters, LED lights, grow tents, seedling mats, and they're coming out with all kinds of new stuff as well from what I understand. All of which are absolute top of the line products. I use their Cloudline S4 fan mounted to their 4 inch carbon filter in both of my 2x4 tents and the fans are super quiet and the filters do a great job eliminating odors. Save 15% on any purchase by using the code AF podcast at checkout on their website acinfinity.com and nature's living soil they offer organic super soil concentrates that can be mixed in with your typical potting soil or cocoa coir to create an organic water only medium that has all the nutrients your plant needs from seed to harvest these concentrates are teeming with beneficial microbes and they form a symbiotic relationship with your plant's roots. Use the code AUTOFLOWERPODCAST15 to save 15% on their products at their website, naturesLivingSoil.com. We have a special guest joining us this episode and I think you're going to enjoy this conversation. I was fishing around YouTube trying to expand my knowledge of soil and pH. I was going down different rabbit holes and uh, I came across a channel called Gardening in Canada where all kinds of awesome videos regarding soil and plants and just gardening in general reside. Ashley, the green thumb who runs the channel, happens to be like a legit soil scientist. So she has a degree from the University of Saskatchewan in soil science and she loves nature, she's passionate about plants, soil and geology among other things. She's humble, has a great attitude and she's super easy to learn from. I think you guys are going to enjoy this one. It's my honor to welcome to the Autoflower Podcast, Ashley from Gardening in Canada. Yeah, so if you could just maybe tell us a little bit about yourself and um, and what you do and who you are and give us just a little bit of background about yourself, that'd be awesome. For sure. So my name is Ashley and I'm known as the soil scientist here on YouTube, um, Instagram, you name it. 
but I work on the Gardening in Canada, Canada channel. And on that channel, I basically use science. So that's both plant science and soil science and apply it to all things plants. So that means cannabis, house plants, gardening, you name it. And I basically use my university degree for now my hobby. <laughs> So in the real world, when I have a real job, what I do is more food production type things. So working with farmers and things of that nature on a much larger scale. But for my hobby, I like to take that and then obviously apply it to smaller scale stuff that people can then use. And I think my main motto uh, is dispelling hacks and myths with science. So I like to uh, eliminate a lot of the confusion that can come with gardening just because there's lots of it and uh, apply a little bit of science. So, yeah, that's awesome. I, um, I actually found you, I was, I think I was looking up videos about pH in soil and I found, oh, really? <laughs> I think that's the video where I found you. And then I started rabbit trailing to all the other videos you had on your channel. And I was like, wow, this girl's awesome, man. She's got so much like information. It's all, so you're a soil scientist. I'm like, this is legit stuff. I love your YouTube yeah. channel. I okay. love the YouTube channel. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's um, exact. That's kind of like one of my main things when it comes to soil, anything, whether it be like nutrient issues or even if it comes down to legitimate um, diseases or pest issues, it almost always at all times, it comes down to the actual chemistry and biology of the soil or your plant system more so than the environmental factors around it. And pH is one of those things where you can look like you're under fertilizing or maybe over fertilizing, but it has nothing to do with fertilizer and it has everything to do with your soil. So yeah. Yeah. I was just chatting with somebody in the last episode about that, how I ran into that with one of my plants because my, the pH meter that I was using was way off. It wasn't, and it wouldn't calibrate, but I thought it was calibrating. And so, um, cause my pH comes out very high, um, above well above eight. And so like after feeding that to my plants for like six weeks, it shift, I think it shifted the pH in my soil or something. Cause all of a sudden I just started having major nutrient lockout, like phosphorus, potassium and cannabis, like right above like 7.4, I think maybe somewhere around there. I'm, I'm, you're the soil scientist. I'm not, but with cannabis, it's like right around there, it, it, the plant can't uptake phosphorus and potassium and even like maybe magnesium, I think, or something like that. So if the pH swings a little too alkaline, um, those nutrients, like they just get cut off. And I think that's what might've happened to me. And that, that was yeah, the was. time when I was searching and I had found your video. <laughs> I think a really common thing with, um, like Fox farms and stuff, more of the expensive brand potting soils, you can get a lot of pH balanced versions of it. And it's really common for them to actually use lime in a lot of the peat based potting soils, because that will help neutralize your pH. So say your pH is really acidic, it can bring it up to neutral. Or if you're very alkaline, it'll bring it, you know, again, back down mm. to neutral. So it's one of those um, kind of middle elements. And it, it kind of depends on how much you add. Um, very rarely can you add too much, but it's usually like one cup per like medium sized bag or half cup if it's a smaller size potting soil bag is generally what I recommend for that. But that'll, it's a really good way to buffer your pH when it comes to that sort of thing. So hmm. it's a, a great place to start. But I think, oh, another thing too, I find often with, especially with cannabis growers or indoor gardeners in general is um, the need to sterilize the soil. And I find that that um, in a lot of cases can cause more issues than what people realize. So that's kind of the other thing that I, I find in the community is because everyone doesn't like, no one wants fungus gnats. No one wants, you know, that sort of stuff in their soil. But um, another thing I try to push like on my channel or just in my platform in general is the use of predatory bugs mm -hmm. so not ones you necessarily are going to see there they're microscopic um things like nematodes or predatory mites 
as a way to regulate any bugs that may come with your potting soil instead of sterilizing it i'd rather you have a biologically active soil that you then treat with more beneficial microbes because whenever you have um, sterilization of anything what ends up happening is you lose and i'm sure you found this through your research is you lose a lot of the microbes that work for nitrogen cycle, even something just so basic and major nutrients, such as nitrogen, you have nitrifying and denitrifying bacteria. If you sterilize your soil because you don't want fungus snats, or you're worried about thrips or whatever the case is, what ends up happening is you end up just destroying any sort of, um, microbial processes that could be there. And some people will argue that, oh, well, they'll come back, they'll recolonize quickly. And there's been a lot of research done on that um, in the agriculture world when it comes to using like fertilizers or pesticides. And they do say that microbes will recolonize like a soil really, really quickly, usually within 48 to 72 hours. The issue is that when you're dealing with a cannabis um, growing setup in a grow tent, like what we were talking about before you started recording, it's a really it's its own micro environment. And so it doesn't have the exposure to the new assets it needs to recolonize that soil with beneficial. And then if you were to inoculate with like a manure or a compost, there's nothing saying that that biological, biologically active compost or manure wouldn't also have those harmful microbes or bugs or fungus gnat eggs in it too. So that's like one of the other things that besides pH, I find that the whole uh, motivation towards really sterile setups is less than ideal. The only time I would ever say yes to sterilizing anything would be seed starting. And I'm sure you've experienced probably some seedling loss in your um, cannabis startups. And that's pretty normal because seedlings or, or seeds in general are very, very sensitive. I know in the cannabis uh, world here in Canada, anyways, we don't um, treat our cannabis seeds whatsoever. They come just in the package bare. There's no like hot pink or hot blue, like fungicide or um, bacterial resistant coating on them. And so you're really at the whim of like what kind of soil setup or exactly what your soil is like. You're at the mercy of what's in there. So that'd be like the one case where I'd use boiling hot water Hmm. for seed starting setups only because I wouldn't want to risk, um, you know, bacterial infections and that sort of thing. Hmm. Yeah. So what, what exactly is soil? If we could just back up for a second and like, how is, (laughs) how is soil, how is soil different from just dirt? (laughs) Yeah. Uh, you know, it's a good question. And it's a really common question I get now. I never Mm -hmm. used to get this because like all the joke always used to be that people would say like, Oh, it's just dirt. But and a soil scientist will always say like, no, it's soil. But I find it's more often questioned because of the whole movement for soil and like soil conservation and stuff with like all the new documentaries and stuff that have come out lately. And so soil is something that's alive (laughs) and it's a mix of both organic, inorganic, um, biologically alive and inert products. So when we talk about soil, soil, we're talking usually about three different factors. We're talking about clay, silt, and sand. The groupings of this may differ. There may be more clay, more silt, more sand, but ultimately those are your inorganic components of your soil. And then within your soil, you have um, kind of like a matrix. And so you'll have areas where particles, even in your peat moss base or your coconut coir based soils, you'll have um, areas where the soil isn't necessarily completely compacted. And in those areas, we call those pore space. And so there's like, if you think of pore space, there's three components. There's the inorganic component, which would be your sand, silt, or clay. 
Then there could be for your potting soil people um, that are using like a peat-based potting soil or coconut coir based potting soil, you'd have your organic compound, which would be your threads of peat. And then in between that, you'd have your air, your water, and your nutrients. And the key to any soil that's healthy is that you have equal or equilibrium between all those parts. So you need to still have air in every single pore space along with nutrients and water because it's kind of like a smoothie. So you don't want your smoothie to be all separated out into groupings. You know how you do your Slurpees, we call them in Canada, where you have like your slushy, you have, you know, blue raspberry and then, you know, pink lemonade on top and layer. You want it actually all kind of mixed together when it comes to a soil. And so that's kind of the definition of a soil. Now, how, when people refer to dirt, we usually think of it as dead soil. So soil that's missing either one or more of those components, or it is completely sterile, meaning it has all those components, but there's absolutely zero bacteria, fungi, protozoa, eukaryotes, anything in there to actually change any of the components of that into a useful product. And so, which would be then used by the plant. So that's kind of the big difference between the two. Technically, um, from like a soil scientist perspective, people who grow through like LECA, peat, coconut choir, hydroponics, um, anything like that, we usually call those substrates, mm. like for growing medium, not soil so much, but it's just kind of transferred into if you're growing in peat moss or you're growing in potting soil, then you're growing in soil, right? So we've adapted <laughs> to that world as it's come at us. But usually if we're referencing it um, in any way, shape or form, we very rarely will call it potting soil. We'll say growing medium or peat-based growing medium, not soil. So, because technically it's not soil. <laughs> I never even thought of that, but that's so true. It's like potting soil. That's just like, it's just like a soil in a pot, you know, like yeah. a, a man-made thing almost, you know, I never thought of that. It's, it's not actual like soil, like you would find on the floor, forest floor. No, no, it's totally different. Yeah. It, it, it should be treated completely different. Cause it, if you look at soil, soil, it's actual, mostly inorganic material, but when you look at potting soil, it's all organic. Like most of that was alive at one point, minus obviously like your perlite or pumice or whatever other amendment is in there. But for the most part, it is completely organic and therefore it can act or interact much differently than what an actual soil would. And for example, one of those things is very low pH is very common with a peat based potting soil compared to an actual soil. So. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. What yeah. about, what about microbes? What, what are microbes or I guess more specifically, like what are some of the um, microbes that you find in soil? in soil? Well, I think the main ones when it comes to growing, um, we're looking at like, uh, nitrifying, denitrifying bacteria. We're looking at nematodes that are predatory that are eating any sort of, um, harmful fungal spores or, pre um, predators essentially that are in our soil system. Um, and then we've got things like fungi that's really big right now and coming into the space of gardening. I'm sure you guys are hearing more and more about myco or mycorrhizal fungi, um, both endo and ecto. So both serve different purposes and uh, can help with both nutrient absorption, water absorption, that sort of thing. Um, and then there's also just macro type bugs. So things such as, you know, you'll call them pill bugs or spider mites. You'll see things like that on the surface here. So not always bad ones. Like the, there's white mites out there that you'll see crawling across your soil that are actually very, very good. Um, and then you have even just like phosphate solubilizing bacterias. And oddly enough, you've got your plant roots and your plant roots will send out things like exudates, which are very specific sets of sugars. And they're, pretty much telling the soil 
and the bugs within that soil, what they need. So they'll send out like a specific exudate to attract um, specific microbes that help solubilize, for example, maybe magnesium. And so what they'll do is those microbes will then colonize in that area because they have the exact food source they want that was emitted by that plant. And the in turn decomposition process would result in available, bioavailable magnesium for them. So that's something to think about. Another one that people don't really think about very often that I think people should get more excited about is algae. <laughs> so algae is like another component of soil microbiology that is heavily underestimated because they actually can add oxygen to your soil. So if you ever see mm. fungi or algae on your soil surface, don't freak out. It's a good thing. <laughs> Just okay. means that it's biologically active and decomposing. So Okay. Yeah. yeah. That is so amazing. It is, it is absolutely mind blowing what you just explained about how a plant will send out these exudates. Is that how you pronounce it? Is that yeah. It? Yeah. Exudate. That's just, it's like, they're communicating. It's like, they're, they're saying, Hey, uh, I need magnesium, you know, and so it it sends out this message, so to speak, uh, and then the the microbes, like the army, like the the species that specializes in magnesium, like come running over to the rescue to provide magnesium for that plant. Is that correct? Because yeah. it's it's a symbiotic relationship, right, between the two. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That is just yeah, mind blowing. So when you have like a plant, for example, and you're looking at, if you were to dig like a profile in your containers with your um, pot and you were to, you know, see inside everything where your roots are is called your rhizosphere. So it's like a very specific area within your soil system. And everything within that rhizosphere is in equilibrium with each other and talking to each other. And so whenever we place fertilizer um, outside of our rhizosphere, and that could be on top of our rhizosphere, below the reach of our rhizosphere, or on the sides of it, um, there's a lot of nutrients that aren't water soluble. And therefore those nutrients are just going to sit in those borders because it's not a part of the club yet. And so where your roots touch is where most of your nutrients is going to come from. The exception is your water soluble ones, such as nitrogen, but for example, uh, potassium isn't heavily mobile in the soil. And so it's more valuable to have that root placed or seed placed. So when you actually put your seedling in, you want to guesstimate kind of where your roots are going to be sitting within your soil profile, and then either allocate your granular fertilizer to that area, or you would um, thoroughly mix in like a compost or a manure if you're going that route throughout the entire soil system. Um, and not all nutrients can be added through water again, because it's not part of the club yet, but yeah. So it's like, I'm looking at the photo behind you mm -hmm. <laughs> and all the, like the roots and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, like your rhizosphere, it's like right there behind your head. But yeah, like wherever the roots touch is kind of a part of the connected system of microbes and nutrients. Anything outside of that though, technically your plant can't communicate with it. So it may not be accessible to your plant. The exception would be is if your plant can sense that something's over there, and then you will at the odd time notice that the roots will change and pivot what direction they're headed in, and they may go to a different direction. We commonly see that with um, areas of like inhibition where maybe there's no water or there's too much water. We'll notice that our roots will actually change direction and go, you know, a different mm. area route. So... Yeah. That's fascinating. So in your opinion, as a soil scientist, what happens, is there any damage that occurs to the microbial life in the rhizosphere when you water with say tap water without dechlorinating it or letting it sit out? If you just dump it right in there out of the tap, um, does that, does that damage any of the microbial life? And if so, is it significant? Like, an, is it an issue do you think? Yeah, so I just uh, did a video on this not too long ago. So it's like really fresh in my head right now. But um, with uh, chlorinated water, some uh, keep in mind, some 
cities will use chloramine, which is different than chlorine. Um, but yes, so they did find that it does decrease your microbes and your just microbial colonies within your soil. Now, keep in mind, when I referenced the fact that you're in a microenvironment, uh, besides like you're not in that great outdoors, you don't have connection to the earth. So your recolonization process is a little bit more fragile than if you were to grow outdoors when you're growing indoors, because you don't have access to unlimited amounts of microbes and a huge diversity of them. But they found that it did kill off microbial colonies, but they found that it was only happening when the plants were watered every single day um, up for an entire month. So they found that it did kill them in the potting soil scenarios, but that they are able to recolonize within 24 hours. Where they had issues was within the test um, set where they were watering with that chlorinated water every single day for 30 days straight. And so those colonies never had a chance to rebound, but the ones that were watered once a week, um, you know, maybe twice a week, there was enough time in between for the colonies to come back to their full amount, which was 24 hours in general. Now you have to keep in mind that if you're thinking this way and you're like, okay, I now know that this is affecting my microbial colonies. I'm still scared of this. I want to make sure I'm not affecting it too much. So I'm going to start treating my water. I don't want to, I no longer want to water with chlorine you have to figure out what your city uses. So in Canada, I think it's 47 cities total use chloramine. My city is one of those cities that use chloramine. If you have chlorine, you can let it sit out for 24 hours and chlorine is very volatile and it will gas off. Chloramine is not. Chloramine is staying in your water even if you leave it out for three, four weeks. It's not going anywhere. It's too stabilized to leave. So in that case, you would have to use um, like a fish tank dechlorinator or dechlorinator. And so, uh, for example, I use Prime. It's like a red bottle, couple drops go a long way. So you could add that to your chloramine water and that's going to get rid of, it's going to destabilize the chloramine and make turn it into chlorine basically so it can gas off over time. So yeah, that's like, it will affect it. Um, the studies, like when I was reading through it, doing research for my YouTube video on the topic, I found it really interesting, but carbonated spring water is like the Cadillac of all waters to use <laughs> when watering anything indoors or out. So that's a fun interesting. Might, yeah. have to, might have to do a test run of that and document it. That'd be fun. <laughs> you should. Yeah. It was, uh, I think it was university of Illinois. Uh, their egg group did that in a greenhouse uh, scenario. And it's because spring water has little to no chlorine, fluorine, zero chloramine. Um, and combined with the CO2 from the carbonation, apparently uh, mm. helps with like nutrient uptake. And it's particularly good if you have like a really warm environment or you're growing outdoors where there's lots of heat stress, because when you have the CO2 in the water, once it's entered into the soil, yes, some does gas off, but the plant also will grab that CO2 through the roots and use it in the photosynthetic process, which means that the stomata and where the guard cells in particular don't open the stomata to the environment around it when it's time to respire, it keeps those stomata closed. So in the event of a drought or high heat, there's less wilting that happens because the stomata never had to open because it was able to capture all its CO2 needs for photosynthesis through the roots because of the CO2 out of the carbonated water. So it wow. was really interesting. Yeah, it was a crazy study. I was literally going into that video thinking like, okay, I already know what this is going to be. It's going to be tap water or nothing. Like I'm going to debunk this. And then I was like, oh no, like I'm totally wrong. <laughs> but yeah. Wow. Yeah. 
That's interesting. Wow. That's really interesting. I might have to try that out. I wonder if that's expensive though. Like carbonated spring water. Is that, um, you know, it, so ever since I read that, I was looking at like really cheap ways to do it. And technically you would just go to Costco and get like their big green, uh, in Canada, they have like big green jugs. They're like called, they're bigger than collagen jugs. That's spring water. And then you would just like use a soda stream from home hmm. to inject your CO2. So you would just like put your spring water into like a soda stream jug and then you would just like put it on your soda stream which i have one and then that would be like your carbonated water wow i wonder if that would be because a lot of people um put you know like little co2 dispensers that companies sell on the market um, in their grow tents and a, a lot of us aren't so sure that those work properly where i just don't i don't know personally I, i'm just skeptical of it but um Anyways, I wonder if, if you've got that carbonated water and when, like you were saying with the CO2 and the roots and stuff, if that would kind of, um, help out in that area and not necessarily, um, where it can kind of, you wouldn't need a CO2 dispenser up top, so to speak. I wonder no, if you, kinda... you wouldn't cause you're, um, so like the CO2 dispenser idea would come from the respiration to help with photosynthesis. So like when the Guard cells kind of look like a taco almost. And they kind of like close around the stomata. And so the stomata is like an open hole. I guess your mouth would probably be a better analogy. So say my throat is like a stomata and my lips are the guard cells. The guard cells only open to allow the stomata to take in CO2 when the plant tells it to. So if the plant is under any sort of heat stress or water stress in particular, the plant will not signal. Actually, it'll send calcium around the plant to tell the plant just to keep the guard cells shut. But if the plant senses that there's any sort of water stress, the stomatas are going to stay closed. Their guard cells are gonna keep that stomata closed. Um, if there's no stress, the stomata will open and some water will be lost and CO2 would be brought in. But when you use the CO2, in the watering and you place it into the soil it's absorbed through the roots so there's nothing signaling to the plant that co2 is needed for photosynthesis because all the co2 meet needs are met through the roots so technically hmm. you'd just be like doubling up on something that doesn't need to be doubled up on if you had like the co2 in the tent i know that aquatic growers so fish tank people for example it's not uncommon for them to inject CO2 into the water and then also make sure that they have zero disruption on the water surface so that they can feed those plants um, carbon dioxide as well. So hmm. it's the same kind of concept, but in the tent it works because it's an, again, it's a micro environment. Mm -hmm. It's an enclosed environment. Whereas if someone with house plants did that, you just get carbon monoxide. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Or just like disperse it in the air. I just wouldn't do anything. But yeah, yeah in a grow tent scenario, it would. That's fascinating. Would. You, you may have just like opened up a whole new trend. It's going to be like all over Instagram and stuff. Watch. <laughs> yes. I'll start tagging you and all kinds of stuff. I'll be like, look what you started. <laughs> Please do. Soda stream sells out. New uh, sponsor for the gardening in China, China, uh, gardening in Canada YouTube channel. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. What do you think about shifting gears and answering some listener questions? Would you be okay with that? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. How long does it take for beneficial microbes? Um, and they're referring to products that are commonly used like recharge. There's this product. It's like basically packaged microbes. Um, how long does it take for the beneficial microbes to start making a difference in the soil for a plant with an 80 day total lifespan? Oh, okay. So this is going to depend on the type of micro, but it's going to be like 24 to 48 hours if they're already active. Um, the issue is when it comes to um, microbes, like in microbe inoculants, is the packaging. So I always get worried when uh, microbes are packaged because I used to work in the field of um, 
I used to work with phosphate solubilizing bacteria and nitrogen fixing bacteria in particular. And I know when we were doing our tests in the field, it couldn't be exposed to light. So they are very photo sensitive. So we would have to sit in the back of a truck, like working in like a dark little tent thing to even inoculate our seeds. And they also had to be very cool, but then they also had to be in a breathable container. So I always get scared when it comes to this stuff, but I'm just going to Google this recharge here, this product and see sure. what's in it. So this one looks as though it has bacillus and glomus. So this is a bacterial one. Um, and it's in, so the one I'm looking at for people who are listening is the yellow package. It's on Amazon and it says it's the professional strength microbial super pack. And it looks like it's got bacillus whole bunch of different strains of bacillus and glomus in there. So for something like that, you're looking at like 24 to 48 hours max. So long as everyone's healthy and doing well, um, you're, you're a okay. It's not uncommon. Like when you buy microbes from any supplier, um, if they just leave it on your front step and they don't have like a sign for, or they don't have um, live culture somewhere on the package. It's always warning bells for me because anytime I've ever ordered anything alive, uh, whether that be mycorrhizal fungi, um, bacterial inoculants, even like the spider mites, the nematodes, it will say live culture and it will say, um, something like handle with care, do not freeze or, um, do not let get warm. If not picked up within so many hours or you know, two days, please dispose of that sort of thing. So you always want to look for that when you're purchasing that sort of stuff. But as long as everyone's healthy in the package, and it's a good reputable company, you're again, 24 to 48 hours, maybe 72, but that's about it. Uh, The Hmm. exception of that would be fungi. So if you're looking at like endo or ecto mycorrhizal fungi, that can take years to establish. And um, quite honestly, in an indoor growing scenario, it's going to be very difficult to get any, um, large, you know, colonies started only because you're, you're disrupting that soil system every time you go to repot. So, mm. yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah. Yeah. I have a, um, a guest coming up soon, actually, um, from a company called Dino Myco and they, Oh, I've seen them before. Yeah. Have you? Yeah. So they, they provide, um, a mycorrhizal fungi product. I think it's sourced from like the dead sea originally or something crazy. Yeah. Um, so they have, I've been looking at their product and I've been debating doing a video on it, but then I just, get so dang busy so I forget but I have seen them on um Amazon quite a bit so Mm -hmm. they have uh high performing strains concentrated improves and yeah so they are a myco and I the only reason I was looking at them was because on their Amazon listing they have actual photos of the differences in the roots and the root volume, like the root biomass. And I was just, I, I, it looks legit and it's very interesting, but you should ask them how uh, like potting soil and potted plants, how that affects it. Because I know that if you apply mycorrhizal fungi, like in the garden, you can like colonies can survive for years and years and years, but in an indoor potting soil system, you would have to reapply that every time you would pot, I would think, mm-hmm. because it would damage the colonies, just the aeration, like the air and the sunlight and that sort of thing. So yeah. Yeah. I actually use it when um I mix it in every time I mix up, not every time, but recently I have when I mix up um like a new, you know, soil in a new pot. And mm-hmm. then, um, if I transplant, like I'll put some around the roots, uh, and around like the hole where I'm transplanting and stuff like that. A lot of people use it and I've seen good results from it. And uh, a lot of people swear by it. So it'll, it'll be a good conversation to have with him. Um, yeah. 
I'd be interested to know what kind of string he has in there too. I couldn't figure that out, but um, I noticed that for Promix and I don't know if you've heard of Mike's. It's like there's green, red, and blue. And as they say, it's like every single, they have a tree and shrub. They have like um, a cannabis plant one. And then they have another like flowering plant one. Mm -hmm. And so I thought like, oh, they have to have different strains because mycorrhizal fungi is very specific in who it interacts with, especially when we're talking about endomycorrhizal mycorrhizal fungi there has to be an, a symbiosis there so there has to be the connection between that plant and that bacteria or sorry and that fungi in order for that uh, symbiosis to occur and i found out that that mike's product uses the same patented fungi in all of them so mm. it's really you don't need like three different bags for everything it technically works for all of them mm -hmm but then you have to research because it doesn't work with all plants. So you have to actually research and figure out like which ones you have and if it works with that strain. And it's the strain that's used in the Promix bags. So okay. it's the same one that's in like the Promix HP. So interesting. Yeah. It's the same company actually that makes all of it. So huh. just different names. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you got to sell it somehow. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. But oh. All right. Let's see. Um, how can you create an organic cocoa coir mix? What would be key inputs to make it work like a living soil? I don't, uh, <laughs> living soil is, yeah, that we might have to define some terms here. Cause when I think of living soil, I think of like soil with earthworms and like, you know, all kinds of like bugs and just life and organic matter and you know what I mean like when I think of yeah. living soil so I don't know if that's going to work with cocoa you know what I mean but I think maybe they mean like a super soil type of thing with just dry amendments maybe I think that's what they might mean they're probably just meaning like a non-sterile so like something that um is organic like it's actually a good point so when you're using synthetic fertilizers you can have a sterile soil to a point because the format of those nutrients are in a specific spectrum that's available to plants. You don't need the microbial um, inputs, but for what they're saying, maybe they're referring to more of like an organic soil, so a soil that is microbial, like is alive with microbes type thing. Microbes, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Dude, he's going to town, huh? Yeah. <laughs> oh my God. Might but, be a flea. Uh, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I even think that they're referring to there. But with the coconut coir, uh, my number one thing that I will say is you definitely want to make sure that you're seeing where your coconut coir is sourced from. I did a lot of research on this because, again, I was working on a video. Um, and a blog post, I think, for it on my blog. And one thing I found with the coconut coir is that it's not uncommon for them to get a salt bath before they're processed. And if they're not washed uh, thoroughly enough, you can end up with a lot of those salts in your coconut coir. And the reason I was researching that was because I noticed that when I was watering my coconut coir, I ended up with a lot of salt deposits on the top of my soil and I was like oh that's so weird like where's that salt coming from and I think it was from the coconut coir uh, type that I got but I digress when it comes to coconut coir and doing like a really good mix you really want to make sure that you are supporting moisture I find that coconut coir is a little bit drier than a peat-based potting soil and whenever it comes to microbes in any form, uh, bacteria, algae, fungi, you name it, you always want to make sure you have a relatively high level of moisture. So anytime you let your soil dry out too much, you're running into the same scenario as if you were to use chlorine. You are affecting those microbes because you're harming their home and the environment they need to survive in. Now, it can't be an anaerobic environment. You don't want it to be in the absence of oxygen because that will equally kill them. But we want it 
remember we want an aerobic environment, meaning we have that oxygen, that nutrients, and our soil particles kind of all in conjunction and equilibrium with each other, kind of what we talked about at the beginning of the podcast. So if you can add in like a compost, a manure, um, that's going to be heavily beneficial, something with a higher level of nutrient holding capacity and moisture holding capacity. And something else that I would consider adding in a coconut choir based scenario would be a uh, humic acid would be an additive that I would consider on a regular basis with something of that uh, caliber because it would definitely help in a, in a lot of ways. I also find that um, coconut par can be a little bit on the acidic side sometimes. So maybe just watch your pH and test on a regular basis. If you're noticing nutrient deficiencies, consider maybe adding some lime into the mix next time or adjusting as needed. But again, it's gonna depend on your brand, how it was processed, even just the, how thick the fibers are or how much they decided to you know, grind the fibers up. I've had really chunky coconut choir before and I've had like really fibrous, basically peat moss based type stuff before too. So it all depends on the product you have, but those are some of the things that I would definitely watch out for when you're using that sort of medium. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a good one. I think what is your take on neem meal in the soil acting as a systemic preventative for pests? I use the Clackamas coot mix and have no bug problems anymore. This effect is pretty awesome, but should I be worried about the neem expressing itself? This is a word I don't know how to pronounce and I should have looked that up before I did the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> not noxiously not in the noxious buds. noxious is that what it i wanted to say nauseous but i don't think plants get nauseous <laughs> so this effect is pretty awesome but should i be worried about the neem expressing itself noxiously in the buds okay so they're talking about like systemic pesticides um okay and neem is one of those ones that can be considered a systemic pesticide um, I wouldn't worry about it. So neem is very, very specific and how it works in the system. And it all comes down to the tree it's off of. And I mean, one of the things to watch out for is he obviously has a good quality product. So that's, you know, issue a is finding a good quality product for us can Canadians, it's illegal. We can't get actual neem here. Oh, wow. Fun fact. Yeah. So the only way a Canadian can get legitimate neem oil that uh, would work would be through a um, Swadesh market, actually, uh, which then again, it's, you know, there's potential that it's not going to work there either. But yeah, I wouldn't worry about it localizing like in the buds or anything like that the key is that when it comes to um neem is that it's what is the specific i just gotta think of yeah it's this azardiachitin <laughs> it's through like the cold <laughs> process it's like a wild name but that's the only part of the neem that is expressed and what wards off insects and the only reason it wards off insects is because it doesn't taste good that's literally mm. the only reason so um my only concern would be whether or not it shows up and you can taste it or you can sense that it's in there i don't think it's going to harm the flowering process it's not going to metabolically harm the plant whatsoever but the way that it works is through it changes the actual taste of the plant juice and so when the the bug goes to chew on that plant juice it's like oh god this tastes horrible and then mm. the, the bug leaves it doesn't actually kill the, the the bug at all it just makes your plant less desirable for the bug so my only concern would be that it would be expressed in the bud when you go to harvest it and whether or not you can taste it um if you are smoking it or if you're using it as like an edible my concern would be it showing up like in the oils um mm. on the actual plant and 
then again, maybe you won't notice it there because other sensory factors within that bud is going to express itself more. That's kind of like the only thing, but you would know, like if he's been using it for a while and he's harvested and he's noticed that the bud tastes or, you know, smells fine. It's probably nothing to worry about, but if he's noticing like it smells kind of neemy or it tastes kind of neemy, that may be what's happening there is because it's literally a part of the, the makeup of that plant at that point. Okay. This mm-hmm. next one um, might be a little bit difficult to answer because it's specific to cannabis, but I'll ask it anyways. Um, you could think yeah. of it just as like a tomato plant or something. Um, but <laughs> it, the question is, is how much is too much between foop, which is basically fish poop, uh, another product called fish shit, which is the same thing. Um, you like packaged composts, um, recharge and like just different bottled microbes and things like that how much is too much like can he says can i use it all should we space it out or can we just blast our soil with microbes every single watering (laughs) that's a really good question um so when it comes to microbes or pretty much any organic fertilizer for that part um it's really difficult to cause any harm to both the soil or the plant itself you can never really have too much. However, there's a point where you're going to run out of food for those bugs or for those um, critters that you're adding. And so what will happen and what we see a lot um, when people use like compost uh, uh, agitators or compost helpers, or we see people add molasses, for example, to soil or to compost, all they're adding is sugar. And that sugar causes a huge influx of microbial activity because there's an excess of sugars. And ultimately that is what microbes eat is sugar. Now the molasses form is much more readily available. And in a lot of cases, when it comes to additives, if it's not a direct additive of a bacteria or a fungal spore, it would be um, a carbohydrate of some sort of sugar to help trigger already existing microbes in the soil to explode. But when the food source runs out, you end up with a die off. Now there's like a mini argument in the scientific community that that die off would then feed the remaining microbes. And so you would still have, you know, a, a slight, higher level of microbial activity because now they're feeding on the dead bodies of what no longer exists. However, um, there's quite a bit of sound evidence there that there is an equilibrium. And while you can apply till you go blue in the face because it's not going to harm anything, there's a point where you're wasting your money because you physically don't have the food to feed the microbes you're adding. So my standpoint when it comes to that is diversity is key. And so the different sources are going to have different microbes. Some microbes are going to do better in your microenvironment than others. But the key to all of it is that you add a wide variety of microbes and you spice it up a little bit all the time. So what that may mean for him who has what it sounds like several products, it may be a quarter application of one type a quarter application of another, quarter application of another, quarter application of another. So now you have a full spectrum inoculant. You've fully inoculated your soil, but you've inoculated with different products. So you have a wide scope of different potential microbes and you also have the food to support them. So you're not going to run out of food. You're not going to have a mass staff and you know, you're not, you know, wasting your money because ultimately these products are not cheap when it comes to microbes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, which is is feed them. (laughs) So that that means top dressing with like manures or compost, or if it means, you know, adding a little bit of molasses every once in a while, go for it, but you need to make sure the food's there. Okay. Yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, Have you ever heard of Jeff Lowenfels? No. By chance he's a, uh, I think he's, I don't know if he's Canadian. He's, I think he's American, but um. He's got some books out and I'm reading his book right now called Teeming with Microbes. 
Um, oh, I think I've heard of that book. Yeah. Yeah. And he's got another book out called Teaming with Fungi. And then another one called, uh, I don't know what the, his third one's called, but he's actually got a book on autoflowers as well. It's really cool. Oh, neat. Um, yeah, but I'm reading his book. I forgot what my point of saying that was. I think I had a question and I just dropped it. I'm sorry, but um, that's okay. Either way, it's a fascinating book if you want to check it out. <laughs> yeah, well, he maybe he might have been addressing the fact that um, diversity is key, right? Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think that's where I was going with it. Yeah, because he stuff. he goes into into some immense detail, but in an understandable way about mm-hmm. about you know, microbial life and, and soil and, and how it all works and all that, all that stuff. It's, it's pretty fascinating. It just, uh, kind of reminds me of what you're talking about here, you know? Yeah. 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 No, they're, they're pretty, well, they're about, they're irreplaceable. Like you absolutely hundred percent need them. Um, and yeah, it's just, you have to make sure you have a wide variety or, you're testing different products because, you know, some may work better than others, just mm-hmm. depending on your environment and also making sure your soil is a happy environment to be in. So you inoculating with microbes, but then having a bone dry soil mm-hmm. and you're doing nothing for them. They're just going to die off. Um, which I mean, if you're talking about fungal spores, okay, fine. They can, you know, live through nearly anything. They'll be here after we're gone type thing but when it comes to certain types of bacteria and stuff things can be a little bit more sensitive when you get into that realm for sure yeah have you seen um the movie on netflix on netflix the fantastic fungi no you haven't do you have netflix do you have netflix you should you should you should look it up it's called or fungi or fungi i say fungi you say fungi um is fungi the the correct term or do you guys argue over that in the scientific community no fungi fungi i've heard and everyone say everything yeah uh, i think yeah. it's just you, how you pronounce it i yeah. i bet you you would like it it's a fascinating documentary called fantastic Fung- fungi on on Netflix. okay yeah check it, check it out yeah okay. it's um, soil fungi or like what it, it it goes into soil it goes into the plant releasing exudates and it goes into everything with some really amazing like computer graphics to illustrate it all. It is so oh, fascinating. Really? If you're a nerd like me and you like to just sit down and just nerd out on stuff like that, I love documentaries in general. So a, 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 yeah. a so like a documentary on like, you know, fungi and stuff. It's just, it's amazing. You should check oh, it out. Oh, wow. Yeah, okay. You check it I out for sure. That, that um, sounds legit. Yeah. And then I'm getting ready to interview a guy within the next couple of weeks, who is really big in natural farming, like KNF. Have you heard of that stuff? Yeah. Is that the Korean? Yeah. They, so yeah. And he, he does a lot and he teaches a lot on how to go out and collect your own indigenous microorganisms, like from your area you know, mm-hmm. using rice to make a collection and you, yes. and you make this like IMO one and IMO two and it's fascinating stuff. Um, yeah. I'm trying to dig into it, but I'm trying to learn a little more about soil and microbes and, and fungi and stuff like that for right now. Um, you have to watch my video that I did on uh, lactobacillus and like make your actual la- your own lactobacillus. Oh yeah. Did you do a video on that? Yeah. And how to make like your own. Yeah. Kind of stores that you can like put in the fridge type yeah thing for beer. yeah you can do that there's so many different all right did I, I don't maybe i didn't i oh, know i did do a video on it i did a blog post on it too though like the actual mm. how to do it but yeah there's so many different i love it i i'm so like amazed and attracted to the idea of doing stuff by yourself that's that's it's fun. You know, you can, if you've got kids, you could do it with your kids. Um, Mm -hmm. you know, it's it's like what you're talking about, you know, um, it's just, yeah, it's cool. It's, it's fun. It's something to do, you know? (laughs) Yeah, it is really cool. I always laugh because like when we used to, like, I'm sure the guy that you're interviewing, he has like safe ways of doing it. But, um, I remember in university when we were doing like our soil microbes course, we would have to, like one of our labs was go out and find soil 
from an area that you want to test like the microbes and you want to actually like colonize and isolate the microbes within it. So my bright idea was, well, let's go down to the water treatment facility here where I'm from in Saskatchewan. Um, and so I thought, oh, I'll just walk or uh, like right where the water comes out of the water treatment facility, where it's just been treated, it's full of chemicals. And I'm just gonna like take the soil off the bank there, like the sand basically, bring that back and test it. Well, I wasn't even allowed to open my Petri dish because the professor like looked at it and he's like, no, you're not opening that because I guess it had like pretty dangerous bacteria, (laughs) like super bugs in it. I was like, oh, okay, never mind. I guess you, yeah. you kind of make a good point. Like you gotta, you, you gotta uh, be a little bit careful and mindful about what you're doing there. You don't want to. Oh yeah. You don't want to breathe. You don't want to explode some population of horrible bacteria or something. <laughs> start <laughs> yeah. another pandemic or something, you know? <laughs> right. A bunch uh, of soil nerds doing something crazy. Yeah. Next yeah. COVID breakout. Yeah. Yeah. But- yeah. well Ashley thank you so much for your time I really greatly appreciate it and uh I really just really appreciate you like coming on and and just giving us your time and willing to drop some serious knowledge on us as a legit soil scientist it's been yeah awesome. anytime anytime if there's any like crazy questions or anything you can always like send them to me over Instagram and I can answer them for you and okay. uh we can get your viewers some answers back if they have any and yeah Awesome. Yeah. Maybe we'll have to do like a Q and a in the future with some, uh, with some viewers, like popping in questions and stuff or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a good idea. Yeah. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you, Ashley. I appreciate it. Yeah. No problem. Talk to you later. All right. Have a good night. Bye. You too. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation and even learned a thing or two. Be sure to follow gardening in Canada on YouTube as well as Instagram. The links are in the show notes for you guys. Go show Ashley some love and thank her for dipping her toes in the cannabis world to bring us some good information and knowledge. Much love to you all and happy growing. See ya. Nicotine, alcohol, good drugs. Coincidentally, tax drugs. Ooh, how does this fucking work? The dried leaves and berries are ground up and made into cigarettes by a simple hand machine. The deadly narcotic is thus quickly and easily prepared for its market. The sale of marijuana is even more difficult to detect and halt than the traffic in drugs such as opium, morphine, and heroin.